Hello and welcome to Time with Pastor Otebel, our interactive discussion program that throws the light of God's word on the biggest issues of our lives. My name is Albert Okran, welcoming you on behalf of Dr. and Mrs. Otebel. Today we step onto the third rung of the ladder, exploring the seasons of life. In part one, we looked at understanding the seasons. Last week was about seed time. Today we explore waiting. Yes, waiting. And it's my joy to welcome, leading the discussion, Pastor Mensa Otobo. Doc, good to see you. Good to see you too. It would seem that waiting is necessary but disliked. <laughs> Nobody likes it. <laughs> but we hope to learn the scriptural underpinnings of it today. Exactly. Let me first welcome my colleagues, Pastor Kujo Amashari. Pastor Kujo, good to see you. Good to see you, Pastor Albert. And Pastor Priscilla, no, no, can see you. Pastor Priscilla, good to see you. Good to see you too. Thank we are you. waiting for some understanding today. Yeah. Doc, let's start with the foundational principle of waiting. We've explored seed time. But what exactly is waiting and how does it relate to seed time and harvest time? Well, I mean, anything that relates to time requires time. So once we're dealing with time, whether it's seed time, harvest time, uh, winter time, uh, it's, it's time. And time uh, by itself means that things don't just happen instantly, that they happen within a process. So the, the whole idea of working with time, working with process, uh, is what brings about a waiting period. I mean, we don't just wait for waiting's sake. Uh, anytime you wait, you are waiting for something. Uh, so whilst we anticipate and expect something to happen, uh, we have to be in a hold up mode. Uh, it's, it's a waiting mode. So, it's, it's built into the way our life runs and the way God relates to us uh, in time. Our discussion today will explore several things around why we need to wait, what to do while we are waiting, what to avoid. And it's, this foundation is very important to the discussion that we want to have. Mr. Bussler? Yeah, so Doc, what are the characteristics of the waiting season and what kind of posture must we have to be able to successfully navigate it. I mean, waiting is when something has been done and the result has not yet showed up. Or when we are expecting to do something, but we don't have what it takes to do it right now, or the moment has not come for it to be done. So whether we've done something, uh, we've sown a seed, uh, we've invested, uh, we have started a process um, and we are expecting to see the result or we are thinking about what to do. Both require uh, waiting, that we, we wait it out. So m- many times when we start a process, um, it could be a financial process. You, you invest money and you, you want to make money. Uh, you don't invest and make the money. So you're going to have to wait. Uh, But the wait is not just sitting down and doing nothing. Uh, Most times it is constantly uh, doing what you have been doing till the time of maturation. So um, in in all aspects of our lives, in a relationship, even in marriage, you find that there is a waiting time. Uh, Maybe you want your marriage to get on uh, very well. You want it to be happy. You want things to to be... um, to be great in the marriage, but even when you start doing the right things, the results don't show up immediately. You have to wait for them. And, and whilst waiting, you have to keep doing the right thing. Uh, so you don't stop doing the right thing when you're waiting. You keep doing the right thing. It requires a bit of patience also. It, it's patience and endurance and, and, and having stamina to go through a process and see it to its conclusion. But what kind of relationship should we cultivate in a waiting season? When you are in a waiting mode, you don't want to have around you people who uh, point to uh, your disappointment. Uh, so somebody would say, well, you've been doing this over and over and 
and and that nothing is coming out of it go and do something else so so whilst you're waiting you want people around you who understand the principle and believe in the process and who don't just encourage you to wait but understand that the waiting is working out something beneficial for you so you you have to be mindful of of, of discouragers people who can really uh speak you down uh, because um something you expect has not instantly uh, revealed itself. Doc, in the parables of the virgin, it is recorded that the five who were described as wise were able to wait for the long period. The five who didn't have enough oil were also described as unwise. What is the relationship between preparation and resource mobilization for our waiting period? The parable of the ten virgins speaks to... um, another aspect of waiting and both of them waited really i mean the 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 wise virgins waited the foolish ones also waited so in terms of spending time both spent time in in terms of enduring time both endured time what separated them was building capacity for what they were waiting for. And that's why I said earlier that waiting is not waiting for its sake. You're waiting for something. And in the process, you have to ensure that when what you are looking for appears, you'll be ready. Uh, And for the uh, wise virgins, it was because they took in extra oil. And so when the time came, they were ready. Um, and, and there are times when people have great opportunities and it catches them sleeping. They, they were not ready. They didn't anticipate it. They didn't work towards it. Uh, they, they were relaxed about it. The moment came and, and they, they were like the five, yeah. uh, unwise virgins, um, and, and miss, miss the, their, their time of visitation. I think the challenge is that we don't actually know how long we are supposed to wait. Yes, we don't know that, and that's why we should wait and and be uh, and be expectant and be active and occupy ourselves and uh, make sure that whatever time it happens, we'll be ready for it. Doc, let's stay with that same theme of the time of visitation in Galatians six nine. Bible admonishes us not to um, not to be weary while doing good for in due season. We we'll reap the reward if we do not faint or lose heart. How do you find the endurance that you mentioned, the resilience to stay the course until the due season, or if I may say the bridegroom appears? There are due seasons that are known. It's a known due season. You, you, if, for example, you, you make an investment financially uh, and you, you made a one year investment or a, a 10 year or invested into some bond or something like that, you know the due season. So your waiting is a bit easier because you know exactly when it will mature. However, if you were investing in a business by yourself, working your business, uh, you, you rent a facility, you start your business, you're working hard, you have no idea when the business will really take off. So in both situations there is a due season one is a known due season the other is an unknown due season what is common about both whether you know the due season or you don't know the due season is that you have to stay engaged you have to be spiritually engaged mentally engaged and materially engaged in what you are doing so if you are a business person you start a business you don't know when the business will blossom. You don't just give up and, and spend your time recklessly. You keep at what you're doing constantly, consistently. And sometimes it, it could be a year. Some, for some people, it's five years. For some people, it's 10 years. That's when all of a sudden, what they've been doing in 10 years begins to materialize, some a bit longer. But once you don't know, you have to stay engaged. If you know, 
you still stay engaged. <laughs> no, that's really scary. I, I remember the story you told about the person swimming across the English Channel. Yes. Who gave up just just before the destination? So yes, I can just uh, imagine. She, she was almost there. There was a fog, and uh, because of the fog, she couldn't see through. And and she had swam for so long, she got tired, and gave up. And uh, she was picked in a rescue boat, and uh, afterwards uh, taken to the coastline. She realized she was just at the coastline. I mean, it's difficult when you can't see the end of a thing to still persist. And, and I think uh, that's why for us Christians, the Bible says we don't just look at the finish mark, but we look to Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith. So when we are, we are not certain how things are going to uh, pan out, there is no end for us to see, to encourage us. So we look to Jesus, who is the Alpha and the Omega, and once our eyes on him and we're serving him and we, we're trusting him that he's, he's faithful and he'll reward our labor, uh, just by looking at him, we get to the finish line. Dr. May the Lord deliver us from, from mm-hmm. giving up just before mm-hmm. this. So, uh, yes, yes, yes. <laughs> I mean, all of us get, get to that. I mean, how many of us do, would ever know things that we gave up on, uh, which if we have persisted a little, would have worked for us. I mean, for some of us, we never got to know. Mm. So we gave up and moved on. Uh, but probably if we had stayed a little longer, uh, we would have seen the results we we're, were waiting for. Look, I think the other difficulty is when probably you started a business with a colleague at the same environment, with the same capital. And then it looks like the reaping stages are different. Your colleague is breaking through after five years. You are in your seventh year. And you still can't find your feet. Yeah, it, it happens in every area. I mean, you can have uh, people who are married and it seems like the marriage is just as one big struggle year after year, year after year. And another group marries and it looks like they, you know, they're gelling and everything is working. Um, and, and so you look at the one whose marriage is working and think, oh, this is a bad relationship. It's, it has no future. But who knows? You are building a deeper foundation or you are dealing with far more complex situation than the others are dealing with. And, and it, it, it happens even in church. You know, um, you start your church and uh, as a pastor, and probably you came out of Bible school with, uh, with a mate, and he's doing well, and you are not doing well. Several factors, uh, apart from your personal factor, which I don't want to talk about, Environmental factors, where location factors, uh, the people factors, the kind of people who come to you, all of these play a role uh, in the process of your waiting. And each one of us is dealt with different situations. God doesn't give all of us the same situation, but he's faithful to each one of us. And his principles work for each one of us. So all we need to do instead of looking at what other people are achieving, is to trust the principles of God that he says, if I do this, he will do that. Then do this and trust him to do that. You know, so I, I, I think placing our confidence in, in man uh, can hurt us and, and make us give up on very noble uh, endeavors simply because something delayed a year longer or two years longer. Doc, Habakkuk 2, verses 2 and 3, urges us to write down the vision, make it plain, because it is for an appointed time, like the due season. How does writing it down help us to wait for the harvest? Well, I mean, in Habakkuk's time, God was speaking to Judah about something that was going to happen, and God said that it was going to happen. And he wanted Habakkuk to write it so that um, he would not forget because it was going to happen. But the principle is there that writing something down uh, helps you to stay focused. Um, Many times I have been surprised sometimes reading through things I wrote in the past to see things I wrote 
and the reality I'm in. And it's almost as if we all write our future. It's almost that. You know, um, if you go and read your journal or your diary, or I, I mean, it's so uncanny how much of what you write becomes a reality. Uh, so much of it. So it seems as if the, the process where an idea strikes you and your hand writes it creates a linkage and a commitment that allows you to stay on track, monitor what you're doing, pursue, and, and, and grab it. So um, God told Habakkuk to do it, and, uh, and I believe that we, we also have to learn to, to write. I mean, you don't have to write a whole thesis about your future. Sometimes it's a one-liner. Uh, sometimes it's just two, three ideas of what you want to do um, that you are able to do. Things you, you say you're going to do at the beginning of the year, many times you say it with your mouth and forget about them. But when you write them, uh, they stick with you, and then you can refer and see uh, whether the journey has turned out the way you thought it would or not. I'm always curious about your personal experience. Looking back over four decades of ministry and more, can you remember one instance where you look back at something you had specifically written and you were overwhelmed by how big or how much it had? Before I started pastoring, I, 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 I did a lot of writing. Uh, it was one of my um, key activities. Um, I, at that time, I didn't fully understand writing a vision, but I, I wrote down most of the things I wanted to do I wanted to see done, wanted to see accomplished. And uh, most of those ha- have become the reality we are living in now. So, um, I mean, sometimes I get surprised that I could think those thoughts at that young age when I was thinking them. Um, but because the evidence is there, I know I was thinking this when I was just uh, 22 years old and um, or 23 years old or 21. And, and then committing my heart to those things and trusting God for them and, and seeing them become a reality. It must be one of the reasons why you are very passionate about young people grabbing their vision early and believing in what they have. It is. Um, you know, I, I believe that the outcomes of our lives are determined very early in our lives. Uh, at a very youthful age, you literally determining the barriers of your life or the boundaries of your life. Um, and what we do when we are young is so critical uh, because it's a very vulnerable time of your life when you don't even appreciate time and you don't appreciate much, but the kinds of mindsets you develop very early and the intentional objectives you set yourself very early uh, propel your direction in life. And I'm always uh, at pains to remind young people, teenagers, this is the moment. You may not think it's worth it, but you are writing the ticket to your destiny. And you, you have to be very intentional about it. Absolutely incredible. You are writing the ticket to your destiny and therefore be very deliberate or intentional about it. This is a time where you want to call a young person who for any reason is not watching or listening to this broadcast and get them on so they can get direction for the days, the months, the weeks, and the years ahead. When we come back from this break, we'll find out more about waiting time, what to do and what not to do. Please don't go away. Welcome back to Time with Pastor Otterbo, discussing today the principle of waiting. And Dr. Otterbo has been sharing some very insightful foundations that should help us navigate this very 
interesting but also very difficult season in our lives. Pastor Koyu? Doc, in 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 6, Paul says, I planted, Apollos watered, and God brought the increase. I'm wondering, what does the watering practically entail in our finances, in our businesses, and in our marriage? At, at the base of the principle is that we are not the only active people in our vision. There are other players in our vision. So there are things people do that facilitate what we do. And sometimes they may not be people we know, but their activities facilitate what we are doing. So, and, and I think it's a very brilliant uh, concept to also know that much as so much is required of us, there are unknown aspects of what we have to achieve in life that others are supplying to us, unknown to us. So what you're going to need five years from now, somebody may be building it for you uh, so that when you get there, it's there. So Paul is saying, I play the role and other people play the role, but God put them together. God linked the two activities together. So for everyone who is working on something, there is an aspect they don't control. It's in God's control. He links them up to people whose activities help them, people who are a blessing to them. I mean, the, the, the microphone we are using for this, we didn't create it. Somebody had a dream to make a microphone, but it has worked into our vision. And, and that is how God works it out. But coming to planting and watering, uh, planting is just the investment uh, of energy, of activity. The watering is the nourishing of that process. So Paul, uh, I believe, is saying, the, in places where I went to, I laid the first principles, but somebody came to build on it, and that person's building on it uh, created the growth that we see. And he's talking about that in terms of church. It's, it's almost like a pastor who goes to a place, evangelizes, wins souls, but doesn't plant a church. And then another pastor goes and plants a church, and the souls that were won go to the church. So one has planted, the other has watered. Their works are working together. And, and, and it, it works in, in almost every area of our lives that we do something, somebody else does another thing, and then both of us uh, have growth. Uh, it, it, it's in us to our benefit for, for both of us. So do you deliberately need to search for your Apollos or non as really? <laughs> <laughs> I'm, I'm sure, I'm sure maybe uh, you, there are moments when you have to look for people who compliment you and people who have strengths you don't have and people who add to what you do. Uh, so, so that, that, I mean, especially when you are building a team, uh, you, you look for some of those things. Um, but there is also the unknown factor. I am always um, impressed by what God does for us that we can't do for ourselves. Uh, so sometimes without you even looking for, uh, God lifts up somebody to help you. You know, there may be somebody who is in a totally different part of the world who is doing something to help you because maybe three years from now, you are going to go to that part of the world to do something. And that person has already planted the seeds and you will just go and water and, and reap the results. So uh, this working that God works for us is something we have to trust him for. Um, whilst we are working hard for ourselves, we must trust God that he's doing things we can do for ourselves. Doc, talking about trusting God, you once used the various stages in the life cycle of the butterfly to first explain the importance of process and also the dangers of interfering with the process. How does that situate within God's dealings with us? 
I think that the waiting period is also the time when people build strength. And if you take the story of David, for example, or if you take but most of them, um, there is a point when God declares his intention to them, and then they wait for the intention to be manifested. And many times during the waiting period, they, they go through serious hardship and battles, but the battles toughen them for what they are going to be. Uh, David was anointed a king when he was a teenager, probably 17. How was he going to be a king when he's just uh, a shepherd boy from a very poor family uh, in Judah? Um, he couldn't be a king, although the intention has been stated. But after that, for about 13 years, he was in uh, uh, the fight of his life. Uh, Saul wanted to kill him. Uh, all kinds of people were against him. But it was in the process that he learned how to unite people, how to build teams, how to protect his throne when he should ever get it. Uh, all of that was built in the waiting period, waiting for the time the word becomes reality. So that period prepares you for the manifestation. Uh, and we don't have to uh, cut it short. We, we don't have to use shortcuts, cut corners, because you'll find that certain strengths you should have built, you never built them. Uh, and in the story I told about a butterfly, it, it was um, a, a young boy who saw a butterfly emerge from the pupa stage. Um, and so he was there watching, and this butterfly is struggling. And, and just as, as the butterfly struggled, one wing comes out. And uh, he's happy that one wing is out. And, and he sees the butterfly still struggling. And he, he thinks, oh, let me help the butterfly. He cuts the pupa so that the other wing comes out. The other wing comes out, but the butterfly can't fly. Because when he emerges, the boy realizes that one wing is strong, the other wing is weak. Because it didn't, the struggle to come out of the pupa is a way to strengthen the wing of the butterfly. So what he thought was a help was actually uh, a disservice to, to, to the butterfly. And sometimes uh, that's what life is. You, you may think that you are helping somebody by making them jump. And then they don't develop the strengths. Or, uh, you know, you, you think that uh, you yourself, should not go through something. Uh, and then you realize you didn't develop the necessary strength for the next phase of your life. But that's another very scary prospect because it would, it, I, I guess you would probably need the Holy Spirit to guide you to descend between an enabler and somebody with good intention who is literally short-circuiting the process God is using to build you up. Yeah, I, I think, you know, life is learning. Life is learning. Um, when, when I was a young pastor, I visited, I used to visit every member's house. I mean, my church members lived in different parts of the city. I didn't have a vehicle most of the time. I would walk or take public transport, but I knew where everybody stayed because I go to people's homes and pray for them. Um, and, uh, you know, just knew, just spend time with people. Um, I don't do that now. So if somebody looks at me and says, oh, Pastor Tabu doesn't visit people. So he starts his church. I'm not going to visit people. You, re you forget that I built the strength at a certain point and understood my people, their needs, and, and the worlds they live in and the deprivations of their life. So it informs my life for what I'm doing now. Now, everybody has to go through a process that engages them with the problem they're supposed to be solving with their lives, whether they are a pastor or they are an engineer or they are a business person. I mean, you don't start your business, you know, if you're supposed to be working with market women, you don't start in the 12th floor uh, of an air-conditioned office. You have to be down where the market women are 
understand what they're going through, understand what their challenges are. There will come a time when you will be a, your CEO uh, in, in a high-level office. That time will come, but it will come having accumulated the very valuable experience of working with people from the ground up. But if you go and sit down there and send people to go and do your job for you, you will never discover the nuanced mindsets you need to have for the job that is ahead of you. So the waiting period serves that purpose. So somebody says, oh, I've been doing this and I'm tired. Well, keep, keep learning because that what you are learning is going to help you uh, tremendously. There will come a time you, you don't have to do those things again, but the lessons will stay with you for life. Now, talking about the nuance, it would seem that even the kind of dressing required to do that engagement you mentioned earlier at the marketplace with, with different constituencies of people, even the dressing will be different for that person aspiring for the, the executive office. Yes, yes, yes. You know, um, when I started pastoring, I, I used to preach just wearing a shirt and jeans. Just jeans and sometimes sandals. That's, that's, that was how I used to preach in the church. Um, I, I was down with the people uh, and, and just relating with people. And so sometimes I see young pastors who start pastoring and they are overdressed. <laughs> you know, they, they, they're trying to be like some big shot pastor <laughs> but you're not big shot you are small shot now <laughs> so you have to you, you have to learn to to grow your strength there will come a time when you because we go through different phases in life but if you don't learn the fundamentals you would never control the activities required for you to get to the top you never control it you need to learn the fundamentals and it's a process. You need to engage. You need to be down there. And it's a waiting period. So somebody who is a pastor, I can speak about pastors because of my pastor, is somebody who is a pastor now. Um, don't try to preach like some big preacher you know when your people can't understand half of what you're saying. <laughs> you, know, you, you, you need to be down there with them. And don't try to posture yourself as some major somebody because you in any, in any case you're not major so you work with your people and you grow with them and there will come a time when you grow and they grow you grow together the people i was pastoring now uh 40 or so years ago they are my age now <laughs> you know i mean they've gone through life they are grandparents they are but i i was pastoring them when we were all kids. Okay, Doctor, you spoke about David who endured the waiting period and learned what he was supposed to do. What, what other scriptural examples do we have of people who circumvented the process and what were the consequences? People like Adonijah who tried to circumvent the process, Absalom who tried to circumvent the process, uh, of course, uh, good old Gehazi, who tried to uh, circumvent the process. We can even rope in Judas, who tried to circumvent the process. Um, I mean, you, th there are many people in the Bible who didn't want to go through a waiting period. Uh, they wanted to get to the throne quickly uh, because they thought they were entitled to a throne because it has been spoken uh, of concerning their destiny. All of us have great destinies, has great destiny. I, I believe that every human being is born for greatness. That, that's my belief, that every human being. But our greatness will not be the same. We're not all going to be great doctors or great engineers. Everybody will be great in something, but not the same kind of activity. But God has great plans for everybody. However, Many times we self-sabotage. Although God has an intention for us, we make choices that circumvent the purposes of God. Saul was one of those people who made uh, a hasty choice. Hasty choices. 
And um, if you look at it, maybe the difference between Saul and David was one waited, the other didn't mm. wait. Mm. Saul was anointed and he became king instantly. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. And, uh, and David was anointed king, but he waited for 13 years to become king. Please, Please get, get somebody, somebody on, on this program, program as, we, as explore we explore the waiting, waiting season. season. Please and welcome. Welcome back to Time with Pastor Table discussing today the waiting season of our lives. And the number on your screen is a number to send your questions to about the seasons of life for the attention of Pastor Table in subsequent editions. Pastor, Pastor you? Yeah. Doc, in 1 Samuel chapter 18, verse 14, the Bible says that David in the court of Saul behaved himself wisely and the Lord was with him. How do we behave ourselves wisely in the face of serious provocation and pressures? David was quite an interesting character. Um, He knew he was supposed to be king. But not only that, he knew the deficiency of the sitting king, of Saul. Because part of his job was to go and play music for Saul. And Saul would get into crazy moods. So how would you feel? As a young man, when the prophet Samuel has spoken to you and says, you are the next king, and the reason you are king is God has rejected the sitting king. Then you are employed to go and work for the sitting king, and you discover this man is crazy. Crazy. He he throws crazy tantrums, and it's actually when you play music that he becomes normal. How would you comport yourself? I mean, many people can't handle themselves when thrown into such a volatile environment where you know what you've been told by a credible source about your future and you know the person you're supposed to replace and the person you're supposed to replace is not fit for the job because God has rejected him and the man himself is crazy. I mean, the natural thing was for David to undermine Saul and, 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 and just expose him to public ridicule. He never did any of that. Uh, a, a man who has forfeited the grace of God, he still respected him, did not participate in the man's mistakes, but respected him because David valued his future. And he didn't want to allow somebody's mistakes to make him sow seeds in his youth that will inevitably be the harvest of his future. If Saul was going to go down, it was not going to be through David. He knew the man was going to go down, but he said, I'm not going to be the one who to push you because if I do that, I've sown a seed and somebody is going to push me to one day. So, He behaved wisely because for some reason that young guy understood these divine principles, worked with them, uh, controlled himself. And I mean, anytime I read about him and I read quite a bit about him and just follow the story, I get amazed at how he survived in, in that environment because the most logical thing, if David has killed Goliath, the next person he should have killed was Saul. Because God has rejected Saul. He, he, he should have, he would have killed him. Most people would have. And become the king. But he didn't. And even killing him would have been easier than killing Goliath. Yes. <laughs> killing him would be, because he was a guy who was singing music for him mm. and uh, mm. soothing mm. him. I mean, just a crazy stupor. He would just have lobbed off the head of Saul and that would be the end of, of uh, the maniac. 
But he endured him for 13 years. And, uh, and, and the man died. Not by the hand of David. So, I mean, when the Bible says he behaved wisely, it's a whole uh, space of activities. Um, and he survived. And, and I, I think that was a, a very remarkable human being. And the scripture said that he behaved himself wisely and God was with him. Yes. I was wondering, was it the wisdom that attracted God to him or it was the relationship with God that brought him the wisdom? Obviously, David had a deep relationship with God uh, before Samuel found him. Probably that was how Samuel found him in the first place because as young as he was, his heart was tender towards the Lord. Uh, but, you know, God can be with you and you, you can still do very unwise things. I mean, we have so many examples of people who God was with and did a, a lot of wise, unwise things. But I think he made a choice to, to do the right thing. It, it was a choice. It was intentional. It was deliberate about how he wanted to construct his life. Thank you. Doc, let's stay with behaving wisely. Joseph disclosed the details of his future right at the point of inception and ran into some difficulties. What should we say and what shouldn't we say? Can we speak prematurely concerning our future? Um, I think we can speak prematurely. Um, uh, should, should Joseph have kept quiet? Maybe. But somebody will argue then he wouldn't get to Egypt. I mean, I'm mm-hmm. sure God would have found a way to take him to Egypt. But um, announcing yourself always before people would attract all kinds of uh, attacks. And some of those attacks will be self-inflicted. Um, you have to learn to keep things to yourself. I like Mary, the mother of Jesus, uh, when the angel announced all that her life was going to entail and the coming of, of the Messiah through her. She just kept those things in her heart. And sometimes, you know, you, I don't know why people want to brag, really, because, you know, these things can be very overwhelming and very humbling that you don't even want to talk about it and, and you want to keep quiet about it. So uh, if you think you're going to be great and all you do is brag about it, my, my own experience with life is most people who brag about themselves and their future don't get there. They don't get it. They make all kinds of mistakes and abort the good intentions that God had expressed to them. It would seem, Doc, that the social media culture tends to lean towards self-promotion. Yeah, I mean, social media has its strengths and it has its uh, traps that people should watch out for. People put too much information there, they talk too much about themselves, uh, reveal too much personal detail uh, on a world space. And I mean, I, sometimes I wonder how, how people manage it when they put so much of their personal life out there. Um, so people who don't know you know you. And uh, people who want to know you can easily find you. I mean, they can, they can sabotage you very easily. Most people can easily be sabotaged. Just go to their Facebook page and you'll find everything you need to sabotage them. And uh, I don't think it's a wise way to, to live our lives. I think it's a place for you to, to share ideas, but not to share your private life but to share ideas, to share your thoughts, to network with people. If you're going to do anything private, you do it off the big page, um, you know, just offline. Uh, but, but just putting yourself out there in, in that way uh, can be damaging. I mean, the jury is still out because this is a new medium. But 20 years from now, we'll look back and see whether it was helpful or not, you know, for, for people to do what they did. Because as of now, I, I, I understand that people, uh, even interviewers, 
uh, who interview people for job, go to their social yeah. media page yeah. and see all the things they've been putting up there. And I mean, you may do it for fun, but it can it can hurt you. Doc, so what other actions could potentially abort our seeds that we have sown? And so so many things. I mean, I've said over and over: if you trust in God, you don't make haste. You don't have to be hasty. You don't have to try to to live your life to be like somebody else. You don't complain about tasks that are given to you in the waiting period because those tasks are important to build your muscle for the future. So um, dodging hard work, running away from responsibility, hiding behind people and never doing the work yourself, all of these things uh, will diminish you. Yes, you can avoid a lot, but you, you soon realize that when you have to directly engage with work, you don't have the skills to do it. So tasks will be given to you. Challenges will be given to you. Pressure will be applied on you. You must take all of those as part of the things you do in the waiting period. There will come a time when you, you will be a boss but, uh, or whatever you think you would be. But there is a period when you have to take on big tasks and develop the, the discipline of working through issues, staying with problems, and coming out of them. And, and they serve you well later in the future. So attitude. Yes, is that attitude attitude. Is important. that attitude is important. Mm. And I think exposure to programs like this is very helpful. Yes, I mean, um, who knows? Maybe this is Apollo's watering yeah. somebody's seed. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah. So for people who have access to this, I mean, this is free information coming out to you. Um, it can save you years of detours and years of mistakes uh, because we can make our lives effective by learning the right lessons from people who can guide us. And, and it saves you a lot of unwanted issues. So yes, I, I'm sure th- this platform is a good uh, yeah. watering platform for many people. Doc, in Deuteronomy chapter 1, verse 6, Scripture records that the Lord God said we had stayed too long a time in Mount Harrop. What are the issues that you need to check so that you don't overstay your transitional point? The, you, you will know when you have overstayed a waiting period, when you have fear in you to take on the next challenge. When you're waiting, you're not waiting because you're afraid. You're waiting because opportunity is not there. You're waiting because there are things you need to learn. But then you get to a point where you've learned and a new challenge will be open to you. If you feel fearful, timid, and you can't take on that new challenge, you've outstayed, overstayed your waiting period. You know, so um, no matter how well you wait, the thing you have to do must be done at a certain point. And when that time comes, you must courageously step out and, and do it. And the reason God said to the children of Israel, you've been here for too long, was because the Jordan River was before them, the promised land was before them, and they've been camp- camping in uh, that place for, for so long. And, and God says, it's time, move on, move on. And, 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 and go and go into the land. So there is a time for waiting and a time to move on to possess your, your inheritance. And the sign is when you feel afraid, you become so comfortable with inertia, so comfortable with not doing anything that now doing something scares you. At that point, you've overweighted. Hmm. Could age be a factor? Yes, age could be a factor, but, you know, fear has no limit, age limit. I don't know about you, but, you know, 
you can be in your 20s and be afraid to, to take on a challenge. And, and you give yourself excuses and excuses and excuses. So when you find yourself giving yourself excuses, excuses and excuses, you're not waiting. You're afraid. The waiting period is over. And if you stay there, you're not going to make any progress. You can stay there for your whole life and there'll be no progress because you're making excuses and you're afraid. You know what must be done. You're just afraid to do it. I'm going to come back to you to wrap up, Doug, but a big thank you so much for this conversation about which something about today resonates in my heart that somebody out there is getting direction on a big issue in their lives because the issues are really waiting. I believe so. Uh, you know, God sends help our way. And the help can come in many forms. Whatever prompted for this program to start and even this particular discussion to take place, I believe it's all part of God's way of speaking to somebody. So we have to be sensitive and, and pay attention when such opportunities are presented to us. For all of you out there, next week is going to be even bigger as we bring deeper perspectives to the seasons of our lives. Let me say a big thank you to you, Pastor Kujo, for your part in this conversation. Thank you. Thank you, Pastor Priscilla. Thank you, too. So, Doc, for somebody listening out there saying, I've waited, Pastor, I have waited. Luke 24, 49, Jesus Christ told the disciples to wait in Jerusalem for endowment from on high. And the Holy Spirit did come. What encouragement do you have for somebody who has waited and feels they really have waited for a long time? Um, as I said uh, just shortly, if you wait and wait and wait because you are afraid and you make excuses, then you're really not waiting. You're hiding. So there will come a time when you have to take a stand. I mean, if we take the disciples of Jesus, Jesus said, wait for the promise of the Father. But when that day came, the disciples who have been afraid indoors stepped out and proclaimed boldly the Lord Jesus Christ. They were no longer afraid indoors. So there is is a place for waiting, but that is not the only activity of life. We, We also have to take action. We have to make an effort. We also have to step out and do something. So uh, if you are in a waiting mode, may God give you the spirit of endurance and may God help you to build the right strength for the assignment for the future. If you've come to the end of your waiting period, may God give you the courage and the boldness to take up the challenge that he has imprinted on your heart. Either way, God is with you. And if you would just trust him, he will make it all right for you in your future. God bless you.